Really nice to be here with you today. Hope everyone's been enjoying enjoying the week. A lot of weather ups and downs this week. A lot of variety, whether you like it hot or like it cold. Make sure my clicker's working. Uh, technical assistance needed. Pause for commercial break. Thank you, Mr. Kubik. Okay, so today's message will focus on the character qualities of courage and faith. And the specific combination of those two qualities comes to us courtesy of the theme for Camp You Can Do this year that Mr. Creech and my wife Mandy have selected as the overall theme. So the first day of camp will be two weeks from Tomorrow, a three-day camp you can do running from June 13th through June 15th this year. So the theme for camp this year is taken from the ever-popular Jelly video. Many of you have likely seen it, and for those who haven't, uh, it's a really, really good, well-put-together video. And Jelly, of course, the star character is playing hide-and-seek in the woods with Mr. Jonathan and becomes lost and loses his way and that provides the setting for the lesson that's that's covered on having both courage and faith. So to help prepare uh, both the, the campers and the staff and ourselves as well as a, as a congregation, today we'll look at what are courage and faith and how they overlap with one another. And then we'll also consider a biblical example that highlights a lot of instances of courage and faith in action through the life of Moses and his family. And then we'll also uh, have a look at how some of the instances that are common in life bring about the need for courage and faith when you're early in life and then as a grown up and then later in life. So let's start by looking at what courage is. So one of the prime biblical examples of courage is in Joshua chapter 1, where God says to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Now, one of the neat things about this uh, word that is translated as courage is that it means both the things that we typically think of, or maybe stereotypically think of with courage, so that would be things like strength and bravery and boldness, but then it also means the things to do with courage that are coming more from a place of hesitancy or a place of reticence, or you could even, or you could even say fear. And one of my favorite non-biblical definitions of courage is the quote from former President Franklin D. Roosevelt, that courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. So in even plainer terms, courage is doing something that you should do or that you want to even when or even though you are afraid. And most of us know that that is the way that real life works. That typically when there's a need for courage, fear is also present. It's not as though fear is not there in the background. So then, what is faith? Well, it's always nice when the Bible has some kind of 
this word is statement, and there are a few of those in the Bible, so love is and sin is and a few other examples. So in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, we have one of those statements, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So the two alternate translations shown highlight the common theme of having a bold and strong, a courageous, we might say, attitude regarding things that we can't fully see. And that's something that faith definitely has, is an assurance, an assurance of something that we cannot fully comprehend, cannot fully see. Now, this word that's translated faith and the definitions that we're looking at today, if you're into, into sources, these can be found either at BibleStudyTools.com in their concordance or at Blue Letter Bible. For those of you who heard uh, Mr. Kubik's commercial for Blue Letter Bible at Pentecost, you can find these kind of definitions through either, either one of those um, sources. So the meanings for faith highlight the critical element of trust. And trust is what covers the gaps between the proofs that we can see and feel and touch and comprehend and those areas where we can't. Now, many in today's world treat faith with some level of contempt and speak of it, write about it, talk about it as if uh, it's kind of, you know, in the realm of uh, childish fairy tales where when you don't have any evidence you can go from, when you don't have anything solid that you can depend on, that that's where faith comes in. But that is not the case at all. And if you look closely at any of the available belief systems that there are to choose from, whether Christianity or some other religion or atheism or those systems of belief that are founded on science or something else, there are always, there are always gaps between those forms of evidence that are provided, those proofs that are put forward, and those things that you can see and touch and comprehend and feel for yourself. So at the end of the day, faith very much comes down to who you trust, who you choose, who you decide to put your trust in. Now, courage and faith are a great match with one another because they have a lot of overlapping elements. They both very much involve both mindset and actions. Mindset being the things that are internal or inside of you, and actions being the things that manifest what is already inside of you. They both also require repeatedly choosing, alas. It's not just a single decision for either courage or faith. They require repeatedly choosing over and over again the mindset and the actions that are aligned with the character qualities of courage and faith. And they also both require facing and accepting some level of unknown and uncontrolled elements about anything that you apply them to. Again, whether it's the system of belief that you're choosing or specific instances of uh, facing and acting on things that are concerning or fearful in your life. So let's look at an example of courage and faith in action through the biblical story of Moses, and again, we'll see this through several elements of his story that we'll, that we'll go through that involve both him and his family and the Israelites. So we'll start in Exodus chapter 1, verse 6. Exodus 1, verse 6. And Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. 
Verse 8, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So pretty much all of life and life's outcomes are in some way related to our personal relationships, our relationships with one another, and ultimately with God. So this Pharaoh had no relationship with the patriarch of Israel or with Joseph, who had come before him, or with the God of the Israelites. So he saw Israel not as contributors and allies, but rather as detractors and a threat to Egypt. Verse 11, which isn't listed on the slide, but verse 11, therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. Verse 22, and so Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. So Israel wound up in slavery and being actively targeted for elimination, set up for life circumstances that would require much courage and faith. Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. So a lot of both courage and faith being exercised here by Moses' mother and by Miriam, his sister, who very much, I'm sure, were looking into the unknown and trying to hope for the best, but not having control of how this would turn out. Verse 5, Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked, through, walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? There's multiple theories about there, out there about how Miriam came to have access to Pharaoh's daughter. Perhaps there was some kind of pre-existing relationship. I don't really know, the Bible doesn't say, but for sure, either way, for a young child to go up to Pharaoh's daughter in this situation, when she knows the backstory and is desperately hoping for a certain outcome to go up to this powerful figure and make this offer, not something that one could just easily do. Verse 8, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go, and the maiden went and called the child's mother. So this instance turns out well in this exercise of courage and faith. faith. When Moses grew up, he had a lot of hard choices to make and ultimately wound up having to choose between the life that he was born to, having been born to a people who were enslaved, versus a seemingly easier life that was offered by the influences of the world that surrounded him through adoption and the things that would have been available to him had he stayed more along the Egyptian path. Chapter 3 of Exodus, starting in verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. This was after he had made decisions that required his exit from Egypt. He was tending the flocks of his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said... I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. The need for courage and faith can often arise from taking the time to interrupt your normal pattern of life long enough to ask some uncertain and uncomfortable questions. We've all had those moments in life where 
You simply cannot do what is normal any longer, and you need to ask an uncomfortable question or two, and that leads you to the start of a different path. Verse 4, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Verse 7, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God is telling Moses, I see what's happening. I know what's going on. Verse 10, come now, therefore, and I, God, will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So now this starts to get very interesting and very personal for Moses. Verse 19 of chapter 3. God tells Moses what's going to happen, what he's going to lead him into, and then he tells him how it's going to go down. Verse 19. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst, and after that, he will let you go. So during the course of what's about to happen, a lot of mustering of courage, although afraid by Moses was needed, and deciding to trust in this course that God was setting for him, even though he was surely and certainly afraid Chapter 12 of Exodus. This is after the plagues have come, all ten of them. Chapter 12 of Exodus, starting in verse 31. Then he, Pharaoh, called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes and on their shoulders. Verse 37, Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides children, so imagine yourself being in the lead or at the head of this parade after the plagues, after all of the suffering, after all of the challenges and all of the interactions with Pharaoh. Imagine yourself being Moses at the head of this company of what most estimate was in the, in the millions. Verse 38, a mixed multitude went up with them also and the flocks and herds and a great deal of livestock. So they do exit from Egypt, but even after this miraculous departure, the need for courage and faith only multiplied, with many dangers and difficulties of all kinds, coming from both external and internal threats. First of all, the country and the terrain, then the Red Sea, then the Egyptians following behind, and then all of the challenges that the people of Israel brought on themselves in their choices. So the remainder of Moses' life is a long series of episodes that illustrate the need, as we think back to the definition of courage, the need to persist in, the need to work up, the need to muster, the need to choose those elements of courage and faith that do not come easily. Deuteronomy. It's wrong on the slide, sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32, coming to the end of Moses' life. Deuteronomy 32, starting in verse 44. So, no, so Moses came with Joshua, the son of Nun, and spoke all these words of the song. It was a song that Moses spoke to Israel as he was concluding his farewell to them. In the hearing of the people, Moses finished speaking all these words to all Israel, and he said to them, 
set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law. For it is not a futile thing for you, because it is your life, and by this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. So again, Moses is coming to the end of his life. He's giving this farewell address to Israel. He's trying to sum up and exhort and encourage and strengthen and all of the positive actions you can think of to bring Israel into their next phase. Verse 48, then the Lord spoke to Moses that very same day. So the very same day that he gives this farewell address, the very same day that he's doing all of this encouraging and exhortation, saying, go up this mountain of Abiram, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho. The picture that's on the slide I took while I was standing on Mount Nebo in 2005, had the opportunity to go to the feast in Jordan and do the Egypt and Israel extensions before and after. It was a fantastic trip. So on the top of Mount Nebo, it's hard to see the writing, but the monument that's on the slide is a monument there where it's in the area that was believed to be where, where Moses had looked out from Mount Nebo. Continuing in verse 49, View the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel as a possession, and die, and die on the mountain which you ascend, and be gathered to your people, just as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. Because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh. So this was not a surprise to Moses. He knew this was coming. Nevertheless, it must have been very difficult. In the wilderness of Zin, because you did not hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel, yet you shall see the land before you go, though you shall not go there into the land which I am giving the children of Israel. Chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan. Verse 4, Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to to the word of the Lord. So after all of the courage and faith that Moses had exercised during his life, even more doubtless was required at the end of his life. There's no indication that Moses was near a natural death. He was simply coming to the end of his life that had been determined based on God's leading of him and based on his own choices. And he had made a tremendous amount of progress and growth in his life through the courage and faith that he exercised, but now he comes to this end where he sees the promised land in front of him, but does not have the ability to enter. And so it is generally for all of us in the course of our lives. Now, just for fun, as Mr. Vinson is good at doing, it's good to throw a brain break in there sometimes. As I was digging through the photo archives to find that picture from the top of Mount Nebo, which took me about an hour and a half through our poor, poor filing system, I couldn't resist throwing in a few more pictures of family members, as Dr. Pacelli is fond of saying when he shares pictures of us all. So this is a fantastic feast experience in Jordan, Patty Jones, went with us, the Rothenbachers were there, the McNeelys senior and junior were there, the camels were there, it was just fantastic. If you can't see it, in the picture in the bottom middle, there are two people standing in the large, in the large uh, uh, hole, I guess, in the, in the middle, so that's, that's in Petra. And we had the opportunity to go 
to Petra, and the two people standing up in that large crevice are my wife, Mandy, and Patty Jones. When they got down from there, I asked Mandy how it was. That she said, it was great, but I had trouble keeping up with Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Patty was fantastic during that trip. It was a great, great time for all of us. So, what can we learn from Moses' life, from our own life, from what courage and faith are? What are the things that cause the need for courage and faith to manifest in our lives? Well, they can tend to be different early in life as a grown-up or later in life. When you're young, you're not in control of a lot of things. And there are many things that you simply don't have a choice and you simply don't have a control, but your choices and the choices of others still impact you. And it takes a lot of courage and faith to learn that God exists, that he cares about you, and that your choices and that the choice of others make a big difference in how the course of your life plays out. Now we tend to think when we are early in life that surely all of these hard and difficult things will be better or just go away when we grow up. But then we do grow up. And then the challenges are even more difficult and even more hard to get our minds around and hard to make sense of what we should do. There is much stepping out and stepping up. There is much realizing that now your choices have a much bigger impact on how your life turns out. There's a lot of realizing that you are still often told what to do, that there are still many things that you must accept and bear and be willing to go through. And there is much accepting and learning that God not only cares about you and loves you, but has a plan for you and has an end in mind for your life. But then again, still, when we are grown-ups, we again often tend to think that surely all of these difficult things will be better or go away, we'll sail off into the retirement of our dreams and not have to worry or have difficulties anymore later in life, but then we come to later in life. And then we find that the transition is even more difficult. That instead of stepping up and stepping out, that there is a whole lot of stepping back and stepping down and becoming dependent to some degree once again. And learning that God's plan for you is a promise that you can rely on, but much like Moses and much like the others who are mentioned in the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, learning that most of us will not receive those promises in this life, but learning that the plan and the promises are things that you have to continue looking forward toward and having courage and having faith and trusting in even and especially the unseen parts. So how do we do that? Well, let's conclude fittingly as we prepare to congregationally participate in and support camp you can do this year and learn about and practice developing courage and faith together let's take a page out of the jelly book for those who might remember the song if you haven't if you haven't seen the video look it up the song has a lot of a lot of good things to remember in it that are catchy and great for kids and great for adults alike Let's conclude with the chorus, which is motivational for how we stick through all of this development of courage and faith, which can be overwhelming at times, but which has many beautiful and worthwhile dividends. The refrain of the song is, living God's way is best for you, but troubles will come, and when they do, ask for courage and faith. Courage and faith. All God's children need courage and faith. Stand with all your might. Do the thing that's right. And courage and faith will come to you.